Persona 5 Royal is the most beautiful case of depression I have ever encountered. So let's bitch about it. The following video is rated S. For no shit, Sherlock, you will be spoiled. Let's get right to the story. Most of it is the same as the original. No surprise considering it is a remake after all. Though Peace Studio has learned from the mistakes with Marie and figured out how to actually integrate new characters into the plot and not make him feel shoot in. Kasumi has nice fleshed out parts of the story, a little much I'd say as there are parts where they could have used for characters who actually needed it, hashtag Haru got cucked, and Maruki actually feels like someone a school would hire to help fix and cover up their failings. Only to be immediately reminded it's fictional because he's actually doing his job and not an asshole. Microaggressions aside, Peace Studio still hasn't figured out the whole extra semester thing. We start out the third semester immediately, with reality being altered and all of our teammates getting everything they wished for and losing their resolve, cause you know, fuck all the character development and progress they earned literally a few days prior. Apparently they didn't learn shit, so now we're stuck with a catchy Kasumi going into this mystery palace, getting some hints there's something more with Kasumi. Then poof, Kasumi is actually Samire, Maruki is the palace ruler, and he altered Samire's cognition to make her think she was Kasumi because she couldn't handle her death. You'd think this would be some nice plot work, but... Then Maruki asks what made us think she was Kasumi, as only her cognition was to be affected, which we get a flashback into us seeing her ID as being our reasoning. If you're scratching your head here, yeah, you're not the only one. Apparently they thought it would be a good idea to hide some plot points behind the easter egg known as Google. Going to the wiki reveals that the entire student body and staff knew it was Sumire and just thought she was mental, and Joker has been suspicious the entire time after the discussion of the car accident with Sojiro. Where the fuck is this in the plot? And that still doesn't explain Joker's reaction to the cutscene, it just makes the whole plot point feel like it was pulled out of an ass. After these revelations, we leave the palace. And remember when Morgana left and we were stuck in a loop and not being able to do anything but story? Well, there's a repeat of that, but worse. See, now we get to spend the next seven days talking to one teammate per day, but wait, there's more. You don't even get the fast travel, and you're forced into mainly walking and going in each train and destination, because apparently bending reality also breaks game mechanics. Also, for some reason in cutscenes, Morgana's dialogue is Kamida, but when you talk to him in the alleyway, he has his original voice. Might want to fix that. But after this, we immediately go back to the palace on the whim of fate that our teammates can actually figure things out from themselves, while we try to repeat the same task we failed at before. After showing Sumiri why she's not the main character, we find out why Maruki is called Senpai, as he summons tentacles and shows us that Mind Break is his favorite genre, and now apparently he can rip out personas and make them turn into absurd cannibals. Well, okay then. Luckily the game takes a small break to remind us friendship is the ultimate power, as Ryuji blocks an attack with his body. Good job, Meat Shield. Don't worry though, the game can't give Ryuji too much of a moment, as the rest of the team is all here. Guess they can solve their own problems every once in a while. After a repeat fight, Maruki gives us the chill bro, it was just a joke, I really want to help you speech, and like a classy fellow, uses a passed out girl as an excuse to leave. Afterwards, the story moves forward to reveal that they decided to toss away their own game logic, explain what Morgana earlier in the game, and now Maruki has a power called actualization granted to him by his persona, meaning he has both the persona and a palace. If you're looking for the explanation for the continuity break, good luck. I'm 300 hours in, and it has never given me an answer. Don't worry though, PCO didn't forget their own palace mechanics, because now we have to enter multiple times and wait for certain days, and on the next visit we still can't travel to the safe rooms we found, really driving in the thought that game mechanics being broken is canon. Don't worry though, we get more plot. Samuri gets her true awakening after Ella leaves her on red after she first rips off her mask, but now she's fused with Kasumi's soul. Now, this has happened in Persona series before, but this happens without any explanation, so yeah, it's a problem. Also, quick tangent for a moment, Persona awakenings do not stay consistent, and it's never explained how or why this occurs. Joker and Makoto have normal awakenings. Haru gets a partial awakening that lets her stay in her attire, but can't fight. Sumire gets a fake awakening, and then gets a real awakening with a soul fusion. Then Maruki gets a partial awakening that allows him to use powers in the real world. None of this is explained in game, and shows problems with continuity and writing. Alright, tangent over. Anyway, after the true awakening, the game acts like nothing happened and throws us back in until we get to a computer room with a blocked path. Well, can't forget mementos exist. Upon entering, we get a reminder that Ruji is supposed to be stupid, as he doesn't notice the cables are going through mementos which makes no sense as we just saw them on monitors not even a day ago. But anyway, after Morgana fails to impress, we travel back to the room where he fought the Holy Grail and find an expansion added by Maruki moving up in mementos. Getting to the end treats us to a computer room where all I have to do is press a button and boom, palace progression. Honestly, this feels added in for padding. Story-wise, it makes sense for Maruki to use mementos, but his security center is in the palace itself 
and all we did was get forced to travel to a new area to get to a room and press a button that's for some reason unprotected. Why wouldn't you just use the moment to showcase the change of mementos, let us progress the palace, and then let us go explore mementos of our own accord? The story already makes us wait until a specific day in order to actually beat the game. At that point, it's just needless stretching that takes away in-game free time we could use for exploration alongside awakening third-tier personas that also takes an individual day for each Tammy as is, with finishing up Samiri's confidant as well. During our journey to the palace inn, we are given more Maruki's story. His girlfriend's parents were killed, and she had a mental break, which his drive to help her gave him his partial awakening, causing her to forget him. His research was cancelled, and he learned that it was due to Shido, and during the momentous merger, he gets a full awakening. To top this off, in his final fight, he evolves his persona, what the absolute fuck? Speaking of the final fight, oh boy was this a stretched out letdown. The first two stages of this fight are a combination of immunity to attacks, multiple targets, massive damage reduction, and the ability to prevent specific attack types from being used, while having moments of dialogue in between. Once we drag through this fight, we're thrown into what looks like it's going to be an epic cinematic fight. Psych, this is a scripted fight. First you get a red herring fight, and then the true fight begins, which you can't be killed in, leaving you to just use guard and pass the turns until the plot plays the in-between dialogue before finally ending the fight in a cutscene, cause that's always thrilling and immersive. Luckily we are given a satisfying concluding fight with just two dudes punching each other to vent. Not gonna lie, that was pretty great. After this, everything gets the big ol' retcon stamp. We return immediately to the original endings events, with no actual impact. Except once we return, instead of everyone being like, hey I'll miss you, etc., they're all looking to move on their own and start careers at college. This was great because it actually made them feel like real people, with individual goals and not a bittersweet goodbye. Sadly, the ending cutscene bogs it down. We still have an escape plot, but now we're saved by Maruki, who for some reason is a taxi driver because reasons, and then the team pops back up to Cerritos for like 10 seconds before dipping out. At that point, why even have them come back up? Then we run into Samire, who after everything, instead of an emotional moment or a tearful farewell, were given just a wave. What kind of shitty parting is this? They made it seem like she felt bad and was upset when she couldn't make other visits, but now you get the persona equivalent of meh. Then, we get the after credit scene, teasing for more, which would be cool if you know the sequel actually followed this continuity. But that's it for this video, part 2 will be coming soon, I hope you had some fun, and subscribe and stick around for more. But until then, party rock and have a great day.